um, in the interviews with detectives, Layla Forbes, who I guess is a former student now, she's saying all this crazy stuff to the detectives, saying that I have PSU to cause trouble. They spent half hour talking about that. Um, you know, he's basically lying to the judge about all these different things. Um, so when it comes time, when we're getting up to the trial, the judge approved nearly every motion from the prosecution and denied nearly every motion from us. Um, we motioned for change of venue based on a tainted jury because of the infactual, inflammatory, untrue, defamatory things that were out in the media that were perpetrated by the district attorneys themselves. Judge denied that, said that doesn't taint the jury pool. Um, inadmissible was what happened to me 16 months prior to this. I personally had two video cameras stolen from me and I was body slammed on the pavement. My arm broken in multiple positions, needing multiple surgeries, going through months of physical uh, rehab and being decked out on oxycodones. I personally had experienced what I thought was about to happen again. Judge ruled that's inadmissible. Does not play into one's mindset, does not play into one's ability to defend themselves, being partially disabled. I don't have full use of my left arm. Yeah, I look all right when I'm walking down the street. No one can really tell. I don't have much strength in the arm. I can't lift much. I can't punch people to wrestle my way out of things. Um, my statements to the detectives were ruled to be inadmissible because I told the detectives everything that happened through my point of view, how I was in fear. That was ruled to be inadmissible. The Portland police directives that state that they should have a visible presence at these protests ruled to be inadmissible. We also wanted the state to cite which part of unlawful use of a weapon they were charging me with because that has multiple different definitions. They refused to do that. Judge agreed with the prosecution. So he basically didn't allow any of the evidence that would suggest what my mindset was at the time. Because self-defense lies solely in the mind of the person raising self-defense, not in the mindset of somebody else observing, not in the mindset of someone doing the aggressive acts that a person has to defend themselves against. That's the case um, State versus Oliphant and Kenneth Wood. If you guys are not familiar with that case, you three <laughs> need to get familiar with that case. That was a landmark case that um, uh, redefined self-defense in the state. Um, it was a guy, Kenneth Wood, was charged with assaulting a police officer um, and um, uh, resisting arrest. But he reasonably believed that the police officers were using unlawful force against him because it was beyond the minimal force necessary to bring him into custody. The state Supreme Court eventually ruled with Kenneth Wood, saying that, yeah, he did have reason to believe that the officers were using unlawful force against him. He acted in self-defense against the officers. And it's not what the officers intended to do to him. It's what he perceived what the officers were doing to him. Just like me. It doesn't matter what Carenza's intents were. It doesn't matter. I'll take questions at the end. Thank you. Um, it doesn't matter what the other people involved. It doesn't matter what their intent was or what they're saying their intent was. It's what I believe their intent to be. So if I haven't made it clear, my actions were solely in self-defense throughout this whole thing. So of course, when it comes time for the jury to come in, the whole jury's tainted. Everybody's heard about the story. Everybody's heard the things Kate Molina said in the news. Everybody's heard all this untrue stuff that everybody said about me. Some of the people in the jury were at the protest. Some of the people... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of the people have been to other protests I've filmed. Now, one of the, one of the things... Loud. Well, I'll get to that. So uh, one, one of the things that I focused a lot of my journalism on was Second Amendment related stuff. I like to film what the anti-gun people were saying and doing. One of those organizations is called Ceasefire Oregon. I had filmed several of their events. I had actually found other videos of their director, Penny Okamoto, saying all sorts of crazy things. Longtime fans of my channel know who Penny Okamoto is. She's the uh, babbling blonde idiot. Um, <laughs> so that was one of the groups that I focused a lot on. One of the people on the jury is a volunteer for Ceasefire Oregon who's known about me for years. <laughs> So all of our fears about a tainted jury came to fruition. So Slaughter's on, John Slaughter is one of the witnesses to this. He was on the steps here. So he gets on the witness stand. At first, he's saying that I was open carrying. He was telling the detectives that I was click-clacking my gun throughout the protest, pulling it out, unloading it, reloading it. 
at, during the march. <laughs> what? No, I loaded my gun at home. And then he's saying, well, hey, I didn't know. I, I didn't see him. He, he was concealed carrying. First, you're saying I'm open carrying. Then you're saying I'm concealed carrying. Then he admits that he didn't actually see any of this. He's just going off a of third-hand knowledge from what he heard other people saying. He said this both to the detectives and on the witness stand. Previously, right along the time that Jelani uh, Sharif was calling for shooting police officers, John Slaughter, at that same thing, right, right, right at the same thing, was um, was calling for people to carry guns at work. I, I have that as a video on my channel. He's saying, if you work a job where you're not allowed to have a gun, you're not allowed to carry it at your work, you need to quit your job. Thank you. You're supporting my work. Thank you. You're, you're justifying my actions. John Slaughter admits to taking part in the plan to confront me. Forcibly remove me was the language that he used in the uh, interview with the detective. He said that there was a uh, text message conversation going on between him and a whole bunch of other people about how, how they were going to come and confront me and forcibly remove me from the area. He's on the witness stand saying that, that some of the people who were involved in this attack on me were armed with guns themselves. They're ex-military, they're martial arts people. Carenza's on the witness stand, the big dude. He's admitting to, cons to, to conspire against me. He's saying, oh yeah, several individuals approached me, they informed me Strickland was in the crowd, and so we went in to get him. You have these people admitting on the witness stand that they planned all of this out to come and physically confront me. Physically remove you, wasn't it? Was physically sorry. remove me, physically confront me. Now, I consider Benjamin Carenza's actions against me to meet the statutory definition of coercion, which is using force or intimidation to prevent someone from engaging in an activity that they have a lawful right to engage in. I'm exercising my First Amendment rights. He's using force and threats to prevent me from doing such. Because he's doing this with five or more people, I believe this meets the statutory definition of riot, which is when you're engaging with five or more people in a deliberate act to cause panic and alarm to the public along with harassment, assault, disorderly conduct, menacing. If that were a police officer there and Carenza did that, would that be considered assaulting an officer? Yeah. The standard is the same, it's just the level of crime changes. So Todd Jackson, the other district attorney who's working on the case, he's defending the notion of protesters wearing masks while they're engaging in uh, physical assaults on people. He's saying, no, it's not to appear threatening, it's not to appear menacing, it's not to conceal your identity so you don't get caught. It's for personal protection. To prevent against stalking and harassment should members of the public or certain journalists learn of your identity. So if someone's out there committing, if they're holding up the liquor store and they got a mask over their face, do they get to go into court and say, oh, it wasn't, it wasn't because I wanted to hide my identity or to scare the guy behind the counter. It was because I didn't want anybody to harass me afterwards. That's what the prosecutors are arguing about. No, we have a half an hour extension. Half an hour. Thank you very much. And it looks like Randy's leaving. Okay, thank you. You've kept up with a lot of you know everything I'm saying I do. anyways. I do. So, um, so we thought we were winning this case because we have these guys on the stand admitting that they planned this coordinated attack on me. We have all the video evidence of them doing it. We have the video evidence of me exercising my diligence to get away from the scene, we thought we were winning the case. So we bring up, so the way the trial works is they give your opening arguments, the uh, prosecution brings up all their witnesses, makes their case, the case in chief as it is called, um, and then they rest, and then we present our case. Um, we only brought up a couple witnesses, a um, couple of which are in this room, I will leave out names for right now. Um, one of the witnesses we brought up that, that they knew we were going to bring up is a uh, use of force expert. He is, is, he's the uh, former firearms trainer for the Gresham Police Department. Um, he also trains civilians. Uh, of course, he concludes that everything I did was correct, in line with self-defense, in line with what CHL holders are trained to do, um, that I acted appropriately and reasonable under those circumstances. So then we rest our case. And then the prosecutors say, oh, wait, wait, we want to bring up one more guy. Wait a minute here. You already made your case. You already brought up all your witnesses. You already rested. They want to bring up their own use of force expert now. They had plenty of opportunities to do this. Of course, we argued against this because they had plenty of opportunities. 
they knew at least a month in advance that we were going to be bringing in an expert use of force witness. So they bring in this guy, Officer Ryan Rasmussen of the Gresham Police Department. He's now the current uh, use of force and firearms trainer. And he's basically saying that everything I did was wrong. Uh, no one's trained to do this, uh, blah, blah, blah. There's one problem with his testimony, though. His only experience with firearms is in military and law enforcement. He went into the Marines. He got out of the Marines. He, he did some armed security. And then he joined the police force. He has no experience as a civilian. He's not qualified to train civilians. He's never been through civilian-based courses. His testimony could only relate to what police would be able to do in a similar circumstance.